So today we're going to talk about being used in a relationship. And quite frankly, I believe that besides infidelity, being used by someone is probably the cruelest thing you can do to a person. Now, I think when we when we think of being used, we do tend to think of it from a malicious point of view. In other words, it's intentional. It's intentional to hurt someone. It's intentional to take advantage of them. And while there are certainly many cases that does occur, I also believe a lot of human beings struggle knowing themselves, and then they eventually use people because they're rather myopic. And what I mean by myopic is these are individuals who are self-centric. They don't focus on knowing the true value of trust and trust coming back to what I said before about infidelity, trust isn't just about infidelity or being faithful. Trust is about, does this person have my best interest at heart? Does this person have my best interest at heart? And so when a person is using someone, taking advantage of them, using them for their own benefit, in many cases, it's in this self-centric, as I said, myopic place and they're not actually thinking about what their actions could um, affect another human being. And I think this is a very common occurrence. In fact, most of you know who follow my work, I, I talk about the men who are the users, the spenders, and the growers. The men who are the users, spenders, and growers. In fact, I've got a chart here. Please forgive the glare, okay? But <laughs> please forgive the glare. You can see that. Users, spenders, and growers. And the percentage are 20% are users, 60% are spenders, and 20% uh, are growers and builders. So I just want you to see the chart. Okay, users, those are the people, they're the love bombers, they're the narcissists, they're the players. They take truly take advantage of another person. This includes women as well, the gold diggers, the entitled type of person. They're using other people for their own gain. The growers and the builders are the people who are genuinely want to invest in a relationship. They genuinely want to build a life with another human being. They genuinely want to commit to another person. Let me say that one more time. I think it's really important. They genuinely want to commit. They genuinely want commitment in their life. And the spenders, the reason why I call them spenders is they are spending time with you. They want companionship. They want connection. They want sex but they're not capable of either leaning into commitment or they don't want commitment with you. Let me say it again, they don't want commitment with you. Now, is, could it be because they're just not that in you? That's a possibility. There's a wide, wide variety of reasons why they don't want to commit to you. But the spenders are the people that in the, in the surface look like they are potential but once you see the signs, which I'm about to share with you, it's going to get rather clear that they're not really those type of men who are growers and builders. OK, again, I want to really emphasize this. And when I say it's about 20 percent are growers and builders, um, I could be generous with that. That might be a, a might be too high of a percentage. It might be lower. Uh, please forgive me. I have to sneeze. Excuse me. Uh, I had to go to the doctors today. They had to do a radiology test for me and they gave me something. So it's still probably in my throat. Anyways, coming back to those growers and builders. Growers and builders want full commitment, but it might be a small percentage of men. This is why ladies, if you're actively in the dating marketplace, if you're actively seeking a life mate, then it requires to get crystal clear on who you are, who's really compatible with you and learn how to vet for both, are they compatible with you? And more importantly, are they emotionally mature enough? And I just got a call from a, a, a potential client who's in a dynamic. She shared with me the particulars and literally he's, you know, while she's dating him, she's, you know, she's asking me questions about him, but she's checking off all the boxes of why she shouldn't pursue him. And I don't mean she's checking those boxes. I'm checking those boxes off for her. So if you need some support with that, Please, there's a link right here to schedule a discovery call with me to see if working with the coach is right for you. There's actually a link below to schedule a discovery call because my job, again, it's free to you know schedule this call. My job is to help you determine who is the user, who is the spender, and who is the grower and builders. Who are those men that really have the capacity to go 
uh, the distance. Okay, so now with that said, I think it really sucks investing time in a person only to find out that they're not capable of true commitment. And we've got to be, you know, ladies, I want to be, I'm going to be sincere here. We don't, the day, for those of us in midlife, and I always say midlife is after baby making years and before retirement. I'm talking about women, the baby making years, but for the most part, midlife is for those of us 42 to 69, give or take. Okay. And for some of us who are in the over 50 category, the days in front of us are actually shorter than the days behind us. So we don't have time to mess around trying to figure out if this person is truly commitment ready. Does this person really want a deep commitment with another human being? Now, a lot of guys, and this is where women, you, you sometimes, men will be point blank and say, they don't want a relationship but you believe you're going to be the person who changes them. Let me be clear. When a man starts the conversation, I'm not ready for a serious relationship, then your response should be, thank you, next. Okay? To quote from Ariana Grande. All right, so let's dive into those seven things that men say or do to demonstrate that they're probably not, they're pr most likely going to use you in some capacity. And then also we're gonna dig deeper into each layer. And I invite you to ask questions. So if you're brand new to my YouTube channel, you like the content right now, please hit that like button. Please share this video. Please subscribe to my channel as well, okay? And you can post a comment there as well. So let's dive into those seven things. Now, number one is the most obvious of all. Number one is the most obvious of all. Uh, your time with him is mostly based on sex. You know, it's fascinating to me how many men will basically arrange uh, dates uh, or time together, you know, after work, late after work, um, and late on a Friday or Saturday night without any real intention of investing in something deeper. So just recognize, be, be mindful. You know, and, and by the way, for ladies, for those men that you're just beginning the date, you haven't began a sexual relationship with them, pay attention. Does he lead with sex? Okay, does he lead with sex? Does he, does he overemphasize how great the sex will be and the sexual attraction for one another? Those men that overemphasize sex. Now, by the way, I am completely guilty of being on a first date with a woman and throwing out sexual innuendos, okay? It is not uncommon for a man to do that, okay? We're just testing the waters. We're testing where you stand in this. But there's a big difference between ah, a little, you know, throwing out a little bit of bait versus, you know, uh, throwing out, you know, a string of bait thinking that you're going to jump on it, okay? So just recognize the difference between just a casual innuendo or it's really an incessant desire to either lead with sex or he only sees you for sex, okay? And I think most of you are pretty, um, pretty savvy at this, and yet I can tell you something. I think a lot of women don't realize that the early stage of dating is the typically the romance period where we hook you, and then once you're hooked, there's not really much meat in the relationship because you haven't established Where's this relationship going in the early stages of dating? Okay, so number two, he doesn't open up to you. He doesn't open up to you. He avoids personal questions. He might even avoid talking on the phone. Now, I know a lot of men will say they're not phone talkers, but, and that's certainly true for some men, but there are a lot of men that want to avoid any real communication with you. And more importantly, they avoid opening up. A true emotional grown-up, a true grower and builder, he has the capacity to be vulnerable, authentic, and transparent. Now, he might not vomit his emotions, but he's certainly un, he's unafraid to not just be vulnerable with you, but more importantly, being transparent, especially if it's material to the relationship. So be careful of the men who avoid personal questions, especially about their past. You know, I think, listen, I know a lot of dating coaches will tell you don't ask about past relationships, but I'm here to say for those of us, it's a different ball game for those of us in midlife. Our past relationships give us a window 
into how this person might operate in future relationships. So recognize that by avoiding talking about past relationships, that could be a sign that he might be simply using you. Remember I said companionship, connection, and sex without any real commitment if he's not able to go deeper and, and certainly being transparent if it's material to the relationship. Okay, number three, he doesn't ask you, he doesn't ask much about you after the hunt phase, after the hunt phase. Look at ladies, you all know that men are hunters and they, you know, they're provider protectors and they're hunters and they love the chase. Okay. Well, you guys have heard that rhetoric. This is why you're just supposed to sit back in your feminine energy and let them do the hunting because you can just receive, receive, receive. Well, I'm here to say is once a man has captured you, you know, the real question is, I mean, there's this expectation. He's always supposed to be romancing you. He's always supposed to be hunting you. But what you might want to pay attention is, are your conversations, which these days, most people are just having conversations on text messaging. And let me just say this, text messaging. Folks, if you're not aware of this, 80 to 90% of all communication is nonverbal. Texting is the weakest form of communication. So if a man is communicating with you and isn't really diving deep in getting to know you, if the conversations is, how's your day going? Did you have a good day? I hope you had a good day. You know, my sweetheart, Marie, there she is right there. She, she, prior to meeting me, she said she was in a brief relationship with a man that that was like the highlight of the conversation is how's your day going? Okay. So just remember, if, is he asking questions about your past? Is he asking questions about, you know, your life right now today? Does he really, does he ask questions about if you have children and maybe you have grown children, you have grandchildren, and are you talking about those things or is the conversation very surface or worse, a guy who's using you, the conversations are all about him. Okay. Number four. He doesn't protect you. Now, what I really mean is we know we've heard, I said this a moment ago, men are provider protectors. The reality is, is these days, I mean, to some degree, women can take care of themselves. You know, certainly if nobody wants to walk down a dark alley by themselves. I know I don't want to walk down a dark alley by myself, but I, I think the term protector today is not necessarily the physical protection but more importantly, the emotional protection. See, a man who's a grower builder, he's not gonna invest much time in a woman who isn't going to be someone he sees he, he sees a future with. He might you know, temporarily date someone, you feel each other out the first six weeks or so, but for the most part, a man knows rather quickly if he sees a future with you. And the, a, a grower and builder is looking out for your best interest. OK, a man who's a spender or user, we talk about the men who are users, they aren't looking out for your best interest. They're not protecting your best interest. They only care about their own best interest. Number five, you've never met his family and friends. Now, there's going to be some cases where you don't actually meet someone's family for maybe logistics reasons. Maybe he, his parents have passed away. Um, maybe his children live in other areas. Okay, that's the family piece. Um, but it's really a question mark if someone doesn't have a couple good friends in their life, people that they physically you know, interact with on a regular basis, at some point, meeting fr family and friends is an, a critical part of the mating dance, of the courtship dance, if you will. OK, now some men will immediately introduce you to their family and friends. OK, so this alone isn't a sign. But let me just say this. If you have been regularly dating, you've been with each other for a while and he's not making much effort to introduce you to family or friends, then it could be a sign that he's just using. In other words, he's the spender, that person that just wants companionship, connection and sex without any real desire for commitment. Uh, number six, he doesn't go out of his way for you. He doesn't go out of his way for you. Some of you might have heard last night in my broadcast when my sweetheart, there she is right there, Marie, and I joined together. She has um, some shoulder problems and she's going to need some shoulder surgery. 
And today she needed a favor from me and I went down to the store to get her something. When a man is not, you know, when a man genuinely cares and it wants commitment, he's going to go out of his way for you. But a man, you know, you know, let's just say you have a family member is sick and you're in relationship with someone and this is an important family member for you. You know, while we all can have busy lives, a man who genuinely wants to build a life with you is going to do his best to go out of his way to support you. And a man who doesn't go out of his way could simply be a spender. Again, a spender is that person that just wants companionship, connection, and sex without any real level of growth or commitment. And number seven, number seven, he puts off being exclusive and he avoids conversations about the future. He puts off being exclusive and he avoids conversation about the future. Folks, I'm, I'm a big proponent right now. Maybe I'm a little bit biased because in my relationship with my sweetheart, we progressed this relationship very quickly. Okay. We, we dove right in for after our, we had our first two dates when I was in Chicago and she came out to Los Angeles and spent four days with me. And we agreed if this is going to work, that something that, that we're going to have to take this distance and shrink it. And over the next few months, we came to the conclusion we'd move in together. OK, we were very intentional in our conversations. OK, so we had the companionship. We had the connection. We had the sex. OK, and so what for us to make this relationship work, we had to be committed to one another, which include in our particular case, moving in together. Now, I'm not suggesting someone you meet tomorrow and three or four months later, in our case, it was five months, you move in together. But I'm here to say, it's time to like lay your cards on. Listen, if a man wants to have sex with you, if he wants to be physical with you, then you have every right to establish you want monogamy, you want exclusivity, okay? Now, that's a form of commitment, monogamy and exclusivity, but I wanna take it a step further, is having deeper conversations about commitment. Folks, if you follow my channel, you know, I always say this, ask a man, what does commitment mean to you? But more importantly, what does commitment look like for you? In my particular case, you guys know my rhetoric. I said, at a minimum, it was we'd spend three or four days and nights a week together doing shared activities, hobbies, mutual interests, spending time with family and friends, traveling together, teamwork, teamwork building skills, both in our personal or professional life, intimacy, both physical and emotional intimacy that leads to either moving in together, or getting married. That was the standard. So I invite you to get clear on what your standard is. Now, some of you don't want to get married. I get that. And some of you don't want to live with person but let's think about this you know today i was watching a video from a financial planner about uh social security okay and you know when when's the best time to take some social security at age 62 or at age 70. and and i said earlier today i was in the hospital getting some um some radio i was getting some x-rays um looks like i was just having a little hard time swallowing uh, everything seems to be fine, but I'm there in the hospital and, you know, it's an elderly group of people. I've gone to the doctor recently. You know, we get to a point in our lives after 50, 55, 60, where going to the doctor is becoming a regular thing. Okay. Why am I bringing this up? Because having a partner to be there for you, as we get into that not quite senior citizen, I'm not there yet, or at least I don't wanna consider myself there, but as you're moving towards that, cat, that place in your life, wouldn't it be better to have a partner in your life, a real partner? You know, my, um, my mother-in-law, my ex-mother-in-law, she got divorced, I believe at age 58, 59. She met a widower, um, he was a couple years older, and um, they got married within eight months, and they, they were together for, God, 25 plus years until he just passed away. You know, being 60 is not a death sentence. It's still plenty of time to actually have a full rich life. And it turns out she was married to him. He was a widower longer than he was married to his first wife that he had his children with, or it was like equals or about the amount, some about similar amount of years, 25, 26, 27 years each. 
So we're still at the stage where we can have a full life with someone else. I was only married. I, I knew my wife for a total of three or 15 years before we separated and married 12 and a half. So there's still a full rich life for us with somebody else. Don't waste it on people who are unclear if they want commitment. So be more diligent at determining who are those men who are the users and who are the spenders, because a lot of times men are wasting your time. They're, they're not intentionally using you, but because they're self-centered, they by default are using you. And I don't want you to get trapped in that, um, that sp space. Okay. Those are the seven, I'll just rep uh, repeat them, seven uh, ways or th things that men say or do that demonstrate they're using you. Your time together is mostly sex. That's rather obvious. He doesn't open up to you. He avoids personal questions. He doesn't ask you, uh, about your life. He doesn't protect you from an emotional standpoint. He, um, you never meet his family and friends. He doesn't go out of his way for you, like if you're sick or something like that. And lastly, he puts off being exclusive and avoids the conversation about the future. All right. Did you find value in that? Please let me know. Please hit that like button. Please share this video. Please post a comment and uh, please subscribe to my channel if you're brand new. All right. If you're familiar with my format, this is the time where I take questions. Okay. So there's a little chat box in the live chat box. There's a little, um, and if you have a question, write the word question, then post the question there after, or you can purchase a super sticker, super chat with a little dollar sign. All the monies from the super sticker, super chat goes to a scholarship fund in the name of my son, Connor Asley. That's a picture of him right there. It's my son who passed away by, oh God, it's coming up on five years. Uh, and in his honor, I've started a scholarship fund to donate to causes like the Hoffman Process and Insight Institute. And last year, I think we donated close to $3,000. So thank you so much. And if you're watching the replay, please hit that super thanks. All right, let's scroll here. I saw a question earlier, so bear with me. Uh, oh, okay. So Gail writes, question. I have a very important question. I've been talking and texting with a guy I met on a dating site. He's still working and lives about four hours away. We've yet to meet. It's been nine, nine weeks. Um, I think there's a follow up here. There was a couple instances that I talked to him and he was very sick. I could hear it in his voice. And plus his company makes them work a lot of weekends, though it's hard for us both to meet. Okay, there isn't a question there, but I'm gonna deduce something from this. Folks, listen. It's not a real relationship until you meet, and it's not a real relationship until you've had at least 40 hours of face-to-face -face time, because it takes about that much face-to-face -face time just to get to know someone at stage one. It takes about 100 hours of face-to-face -face time to build the first layer of trust, and it takes about 200 hours of face-to-face -face time to actually consider someone a good friend, okay? So right now, the tricky part is you're four hours away. Then I, what I would be doing, if you've established some rapport with this person, talk about the future. Instead of talking about the past and the present, have some real serious conversations about the future. The tricky part is this, and I've done the long distance thing prior to meeting Marie. I did the whole talking, 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 met someone, had sex on the first date, and never saw them again. I was you know, not intentionally being malicious, it just... A lot of times you connect on a physical level, but it wasn't really all there for the uh, for something deeper. OK, so with that said, the sooner you two can meet, the better. OK, I wouldn't I'd be careful dragging this out. That's my you didn't ask a question, but that's my inclination on that. All right. I saw another question here earlier. Bear with me. OK, from Remex Film Art question. He does not reach out, but says I'm his significant other. He has dreams of becoming a mogul after quitting his job. I'm a placeholder for him until he gets, uh, am, am I a placeholder for him until he gets his life together? While it's hard to know that for sure, he doesn't reach out, but says I'm his significant other. He has dreams of becoming a mogul. So it sounds like his libido is in his professional life. So again, folks, uh, these days to build a traditional 
juicy, delicious, healthy, happy relationship. I'm saying traditional because today we have cyber relationships, we have situationships, we have casual relationships, we have friends with benefits, uh, the list goes on and on. If you want a traditional, juicy, delicious, ha healthy, happy relationship, you my invitation for you is you invest somewhere between two, three, four days and nights a week together, doing shared activities and hobbies, mutual interests, spending time with family and friends, traveling together, teamwork, building skills, both in your personal and your professional life, intimacy, both physical and emotional intimacy that leads to either moving into getting or getting married. That's the standard that I invite you all to have, okay? So have those conversations sooner rather than later. That's my invitation for you. All right, let's keep swimming. Bump, 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 bump. If you have a question, all right, here we go from Pam. Question. Online, a guy initiated chat. I responded. He replied a week later. Gave him a chance and responded. Again, no reply for five days. Then he asked to meet me. Odd, your thoughts. You know, that's a great question. I think with the online dating world, you have to recognize that the average person is probably communicating with multiple people at the same time. So a couple factors to consider. How close do you live with one another? How busy does this person's life, you know, whether it's his work, children, other obligations, you have to take all this into consideration. Look, Marie and I spoke, we talked for one year before we actually met. Now, it was long distance. During the course of that year, we probably only... I, I, I'm guessing somewhere between seven and 10 telephone calls, uh, some text messages, and certainly some conversations um, uh, on, on Facebook because we kept in touch through Facebook. Um, and when I say kept in touch, we were mutual friends on Facebook. So in this particular case, you have to establish meeting, get the meeting out of the way. And if there is a spark there, then the goal would be to have regular contact with one another to get the ball rolling, to get this relationship off the ground because this piecemeal way people are dating isn't really working for the long run, at least for the traditional relationships that I talk about. So Pam, thank you so much for that question. Uh, Christine says, great value. What happened to your son? Well, first off, thank you, Christina. Uh, my son had an accident and he passed away. So thank you so much. Oh, and I appreciate the $5 super sticker. Thank you so much. All right, let's get uh, G, on, G. Leon question. I'm a caregiver for a dementia client who is 25 years older than me. He has fallen in love and I'm very fond of him. Fortunately, unfortunately, he has dementia. What should I do? Well, again, you have to, add, I mean, my, my vantage point is I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, you're fond of him. I get that. And you're his uh, caretaker, caregiver. So probably what he's experienced is what's known as transference. I know um, my father, who's 97 years old, feels a sense of care for the caretakers that take care of him and at his assisted living facility. So, um, and even if they claim it's love, the real question you have to ask yourself, what type of life do you want for yourself? Do you want a relationship where you're traveling together, where you're helping each other out? You know, if this person needs a caretaker, then you basically, if you're gonna choose this relationship, then you're doing so choosing knowing that you are his nurse and probably not a real life partner. That's just a rough, sketch out of what I think of that. So um, you probably know that answer better than I. So um, sending you a lot of love on that one. I, I feel for him as well as you. So thank you. Rita asked question. Do men knowingly talk about sex or a lot or are they oblivious? Do you think app dating apps make this more common? That's a great question. You know, <laughs> I talk about sex a lot, or at least I... Um, when I say I talk about a lot, you know, when it's time to initiate, I'm talking about it a lot. I think in the getting to know you phase, someone who talks a lot about sex is trying to feel you out as to where your sexual appetite might lean in with his. And just remember, when we're on the hunt, when we're on the chase, what are we chasing? Are we men chasing, I want to be in a relationship. I want to be in a relationship. You know, I love all the female dating coaches that talk about how men love the hunt. Do you really think men are hunting relationships? Let me give it to you straight, ladies. Men are hunting sex in the hunt phase. 
So of course we're going to do that. Um, let me read the balance of your question again. Um, do men knowingly, are they oblivious? Do you, now, I, I do want to add a caveat here. I think what's bastardizing relationships besides the dating and swipe apps, the ease of swiping, the ease of easy sex, okay? Sex today is so much easier than it ever was before for us men. I mean, we had to jump through a lot more hoops in the past. But I also think what's bastardizing um, relationships today is pornography. I think the ease of a variety of different pornography allows a lot of men to be addicted to porn, to masturbation as a way to feel connected. And a lot of men don't even know how to be physically, when I say don't know how, but they've lost their edge on being physically intimate with a woman. So I think pornography as well as swipe apps have really bastardized the whole traditional relationship um, um, landscape, if you will. So uh, Rita, thank you so much for that question. All right, Sandra writes, question, I met a man who lives two hours away, went on a date and said he could see himself in a long-term relationship with me. Before he left, he said he was going to be busy for the next week. Is he really interested? You know, I think um, he's probably, while he was with you, he was overly excited. And now that you're not in his presence, he wanted to create his escape clause. That's Now that's not an absolute, but there's a possibility that that's what he's doing. Is he really interested? Look, when Marie and I met and after, listen, I kind of blew her off after the first meeting, but then I immediately jumped back on, the, on, on board and, and pushed for her to join me at the wedding. After we had our second date, if you will, I was like, I was smitten by her. Uh, I was like practically begging for her to come on the plane with me. I wanted to put her on the suitcase with me. So, and then from the time we, I flew home till the time she visited two and a half weeks later, we were in constant contact uh, and we made a plan. In fact, I think she bought airline tickets literally within days after she bought airline tickets to come to Los Angeles days after our, the time I came home. So um, if a man is smitten, he's going to make a lot of effort to see you unless look at if he's traveling for six weeks. But, you know, I find it strange for the next six weeks. He's, you know, I'm really busy. Nobody's that busy. OK, um, unless you're you're a doctor doing a humanitarian thing in Guatemala or something. So I'm not buying that one. OK, so thank you for that question. By the way, I do want to thank those $10 super stickers. I'll answer, Marissa, I'll answer your question in just a moment. Um, oh, first, Yola donated to the Connor Asley Scholarship Fund. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Folks, hit that uh, the little dollar sign uh, if you want to purchase the super stickers, super chat to donate to the uh, scholarship fund. I also want to respond to uh, Marissa Jane's question. Thank you again for your $10 super sticker. I really appreciate it. Question. I've been dating a guy for five months. How many of these seven signs you dis of, of, how, of how many of these seven signs you discuss should cause concern? Some of them are issues and others are not. Um, you know, I'm going to put the balance somewhere around three or four. If you're noticing, look at folks. I want you to really check in with yourself. If something doesn't feel right, it probably is. Now, I want to first establish when you're really tapping into your intuition, it should come from a calm place. If you're feeling agitated, if you're feeling fear, then it could be a confused signal. OK, but if you're calm and you go, now, something doesn't feel right in this dynamic. Something doesn't feel right with this relationship. Ask yourself, is this a pattern from your past relationships? Or is this, is it fear or is it a pattern? Do you have a pattern of dating the same type of person over and over again, expecting different results? But ultimately, if something feels off, then you have to honor your intuition. Now, if you need help with that, schedule a, schedule a call with me. That's my area of expertise is also evaluating men based on a series of questions I ask you. I can give you a better understanding 
But yes, if you're seeing some of these seven things, then it should be, if your radar is up, I would say, um, don't give your heart to someone until real trust and commitment has been established. So Marissa, thank you so much for the super sticker for the $10 for the Connor Asley Scholarship Fund and great question. All right, let's come back here. Um, result, Revolve writes, question. How long should a 44-year-old woman spend getting to know a 29-year-old man before she makes a decision on whether or not there is a viable relationship or whether it's time to move on? You know, again, it takes about 40 hours of face-to-face -face time just to start to get to know someone. It takes about 100 hours of face-to-face -face time to build trust. And I don't mean spending, you know, a, a weekend with them 72 hours. You know, bedtime doesn't count. It's that face-to-face -face time. So that's about the amount of time. And it takes about 200 hours. Uh, and this is according to Jay Shetty, who wrote the book, uh, Eight Rules for Love, or I can't remember his new book. Um, but yeah, it takes about 200 hours to really build a good friendship with someone. So hopefully those guidelines will help you. All right. Thank you so much for your question. I really appreciate it. Uh, let's keep going. Marissa Jane. Oh, you've already asked that question. Uh, let's see. Oh, El uh, uh, Evelyn, seeing a man four years now, always been hot and cold, always sees me on his time, says he adores and misses me when we're not together, told me he is a player, not sure what to do, no text for four days. Uh, just like in the movie Forrest Gump, run, Forrest, run. He is telegraphed. I mean, his behavior, hot and cold, always sees me at his time, says he adores me and misses me a lot when you're not together. Uh, told me he's he told me he's a player ladies that's a, if someone said if i told a woman i'm a player and i'm going to use you then everything that happens after that is on you it's on you it's not on him if a man says i'm a player that's telling you i'm going to use you everything after that is on you so it's up to you evelyn what you want to do so thank you for posting that dmr writes question what about casual friends Will it lead to a date? We hug, kiss, text, talk a lot after our league play. There's a 10-year age difference. We've known each other for years. You know, there are certainly, you know, I think about the movie When Harry Met Sally. I think about the TV show Friends, okay? Uh, you know, uh, Chandler and um, Monica. They were friends first. It's the only way this is going to just like in Friends, the only remember they were in London uh, going to Ross's wedding and Monica and Chandler find themselves uh, uh, attracted to one another and had sex together. Unless there's a spark, you know, um, the, the problem is you have to be careful of what's known as unrequited love or building a fantasy in your head about this person. So ask him out on a date. But Jonathan, all the female dating coaches tell me to never lead. I've got to sit in my feminine. Folks, listen, who gives a crap who makes the first move? It's what happens after that that matters most. So ask him out. By the way, I've been asked out by a lot of women. Now, it didn't work out, but it had nothing to do with them asking me out. I appreciated that they got the ball rolling. So if a woman, if you ask him out and something happens, there's a spark happens, who cares that you made the first move? But if you have feelings for them, then make some effort. And then um, I like what Matthew Hussey says, invest and test, invest and test, invest and test. You invest a little bit and then see if he meets you. Okay, great question, DMR. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, let's keep swimming. Oh, here we go. Oh, I just want to, rip, rip. Holly says, this is going back to, no one is that busy. When someone leads by saying, I'm going to be busy for the next week, that's like, I'm just, I'm just establishing my escape clause, most likely. So uh, Holly agrees. Um, and Jameson says, you're a side chick. Okay. Question. FYI, 1993, I stopped, let, wait, I stopped, let him have sex with me because I don't know his intentions. Am I right? Or should I be intimate with him and see 
what will lead. Well, I'm not a big fan of like when you begin a sexual relationship to already cut it off. But what I would say is, you know, Tim, um, it's before we continue our intimate relationship, I'd really like to have a conversation about our, our goals and our desires when it comes to a committed relationship. Is that okay if we have that conversation? So now you've established, by the way, folks, if you if you're watching this right now just mark the time and go back and listen to what i said you know rewind this and listen to um what i said but my point is establish you know don't cut him off and expect something to happen have a say look before i continue any more physical intimacy with you i need clarity on this relationship because guess what magic fairy dust doesn't come down and change his mind. You're going to have to initiate a conversation with him and better to do it sooner rather than later. So, so uh, FYI, thank you for that. Ah, uh, let's see. Evelyn says, thank you so much for answering my question. You're very welcome. You made my day. I'm glad to hear that. All right. Let's see. <laughs> Jasmine says, uh, J uh, well, Jim says, I think I'm going to go old school and say my legs are staying firmly shut until I get 100% commitment. You know, I'm not so certain, you know, ladies, I'm not so certain that's what you shouldn't be doing. And what I mean to say I'm not so certain, I'm, I'm now believe that our biggest, listen, Look at the number one emotional health issue most everybody has faced is I'm not good enough, I'm not lovable, and I'm not likable. And nothing triggers that like dating because dating these days is just a long string out version of friends with benefits with some minor agreement to monogamy and exclusivity. You know, it used to be 2,000 years ago, if you wanted to have sex, you had to get married. Now, back then, getting married was simply agreeing to be together. So it was a relationship by today's standards back then, you know, but today's relationships have no real legs to it because there's no, if you see back then, if you got a woman pregnant, you were somewhat obligated to stay with her. And today, because of birth control, people can have sex freely without any consequence. So coming back to your question or your point is, um, or, oh, excuse me, I went off on a tangent and I did, I did a squirrel and I forgot where I was going with this. Okay. My point is, I believe the sooner we get to those discussions about commitment, the greater chance for success. Marie and I did that right off the bat. We laid our cards on the table rather quickly. We were radically honest with one another. Again, this is what I teach in my private coaching. Check out the link below. By the way, if you haven't purchased my book, check out my book, What the Heck is Self-Love Anyway? A Journey of Personal Development, Self-Help, and Spiritual Work. And the link below. Okay. Getting to commitment conversations sooner rather than later is in your best interest. But Jonathan, all the other coaches tell me to just wait six weeks and blah, blah, blah. Look at Remember I said the number one emotional health issue is I'm not good enough, I'm not lovable, I'm not likable. When you invest in someone who isn't serious, you've got a good chance of being used by that person. So it's up to you to establish your standards and your boundaries. And a boundary is simply what's okay and what's not okay for me sooner rather than later. Is this sinking in? Is this resonating? Please let me know. Please post a comment. Is Say, yes, Jonathan, this is resonating with me. Um, okay. Remax said, Remix says, question, if he doesn't reach out by phone or text, he is in transitional phase and has dreams of being a millionaire. Am I a placeholder? I already answered that question for you. Okay. Folks, if a man isn't making effort by reaching out to you, by progressing the relationship forward, wait a minute. Uh, you know, a man who genuinely, look at, there's my sweetheart right there. I'm smitten by her. The right, when I knew I wanted to build something with her, which was literally within the first few weeks of meeting her, I progressed the relationship forward. Progressing the relationship forward is making plans for the future. It's making plans to travel together. In our particular case, it was making plans to figure out how we could shorten the distance together. It doesn't, listen. 
most men who are emotional grown-ups okay most men who are emotional grown-ups and they are what's known as growers and builders okay now the problem is you, your ladies you're swimming in a pool of dysfunctional men i get it but you women are just as just as dysfunctional as well partially because you just accept bad behavior so coming back to when you're swim, when you're with an emotional grown-up who's a grower and a builder he knows very quickly who he wants to pursue. It's the dysfunctional men that will use you and waste your time. I'm gonna repeat that, it's the dysfunctional men. If you're not familiar with that chart of mine, and by the way, this is not a fact, it's merely opinion, I excuse the glare, okay? Emotional maturity and relationship skills, not a fact, an opinion. Roughly 20% of the population has clinical issues and 60% are dysfunctional. You have to recognize this going in. This is why you have to be a detective in the early stages of dating. Don't give your heart away until you've really established some level of trust with one another. Is this sinking in, Remax? I hope it is. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> Jennifer says, is it unrealistic to think I'll meet a dream man in the grocery store? I'm 50 and haven't had a date or anything at all in a year and a half, totally celibate. I don't know how to act or how to meet someone. Jennifer, great question. So, you know, a broken clock is right twice a day. And what that means to say is, could you meet someone at the grocery store? Yeah, possibly. But I want you to think about this for a moment. For those of us over 50, when we were in our 20s, it was easy to meet single eligible people because we most likely knew, uh, because most of the people we congregated with were single and eligible in our 20s, okay? Roughly about mid-20s in our generation began to be more prevalent in the workforce. So where a lot of people met was in their professional capacity, okay? Now fast forward, we've just been through a pandemic. We now have technology. So many things have shifted. I will tell you, I for, for the five years before I met Marie, I worked from home. I didn't like to go to bars and nightclubs. I did the meetup groups on occasion. I went grocery shopping. I went to Whole Foods. I went to Trader Joe's. I had my little, my bag that was with me. But I didn't like to approach women at the grocery store. I, I felt like it was disingenuine to look at somebody purely based on looks and then try to establish a conversation. It just didn't feel right for me to do that. Um, plus, I was scared shitless. I was nervous to walk up to people. I would like, I look at my son, there's my son Colin right there. He's got brass balls. I mean, he's not afraid to walk up to a woman and ask her out. I was chicken shit. Okay, maybe when I was younger, I had those balls. But when you get rejected, you know, over and over and over again, you just rather just not make the effort to do it unless there's some real eye contact and she's going, come here, I want you to talk to me. So unless you're in an environment where this happens regularly, the reason why online dating has become the number one place to meet people where over 50% of all singles over 45 years old are meeting is because it's easier to swipe than it is to sit there and grocery shop for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. So is it unrealistic? Yeah, I mean, it's starting to become a real challenge. Um, but then again, um, I've talked about singles cruises. I've mentioned the website Singles in Paradise. There are a lot of singles organizations, church groups, meetup groups where you can at least be around single eligible people. That's what I would consider doing. Put yourself in an environment where more single eligible people are congregating. Okay, Jennifer, thank you so much for that question. Pam says, thank you for your input. I really appreciate that. You know what, folks? Uh, you guys have been wonderful. I can't begin to express my appreciation for your kindness, care for both uh, myself and my sweetheart, Marie. You guys were so sweet last night. She's going, she's going to have soldier, shoulder surgery soon and you sent your prayers. I can't begin to tell you how much I appreciate that as well. All right, I think this will be a great place to wrap up my, this video. And first off, if you found value in this video, please hit that like button. Please share this video. Please subscribe to my channel. Uh, please tell your friends about it. 
post a comment below if you have something to share. And now I'm gonna wrap up this video as I always do. First off, give myself a big gigantic Jonathan Barrick of self-love. I'm gonna reach into the camera and give you a hug of love and hope you didn't see the pit stains. I'm gonna ask you to turn to a friend, a pet, a teddy bear, a pillow, and give it or them a hug of love because hugs are a great source of love. And by the way, there's a teddy bear. And we could all use more love in our lives. I want to thank Lisa and Weejin and we join and uh, Babe One and Marilyn, and Melfa and Jameson and Gems Eyes and Nancy and Natalie and uh, Holly and Debbie and Charlie and Denise and Sylvia and Mr. C. Do we have a guy in the house? Uh, Doreen, uh, Lisa, Marilyn, Jennifer, and all those that asked questions and donated to the Connor as a scholarship fund. Thank you so much. Wishing you a super duper fantastic evening. You be well. Take care. Thanks. Bye now.